day 14. What we're going to do is try and finish this thing off. We have one more system call to do, which is... There's my system call table. Here we go. Which is this one. Write random filled. This is exactly the same as write random, except if a new block is allocated, it gets cleared to zeros rather than just being left with whatever garbage was on the disk previously. So, now, there's several ways you can do this, as I said last time, which is we can either duplicate this code and put in some logic to uh, wipe the block, or we can um, put in some kind of flag so that when seek to block and create is called it will clear the block just thinking how to do it so the bit that we actually care about is here this code path uh, we call get to fcb block that returns this block value uh, if it was zero there's no block has been allocated we do some stuff so we could put some code in here, or we can call get FCB block prior to calling seek to block and create and you know do extra stuff there. I'm just going to put a flag in. Okay, so uh, And for reasons of efficiency, we are going to reset that to zero. Okay, so the way uh, so we create a one of these and then we call that we need to make sure that the block that this flag gets reset on entry and in fact the cleanest place to put this is here in the uh, the entry code so this means that whenever we call whenever the application calls the BDOS the flag will get reset so Actually, I think that's probably it. Um, we need to also, act, you know, actually do the implementation, which is here. Okay, so. If it is not zero, then we need to wipe it. To do that, we need to get the sequent the sector number. probably shouldn't call it twice but it won't do any harm so we can yes we want a record of zeros so
We are going to use the directory buffer for this because it's a handy 128 byte thing that we are not currently using. Okay. So now we are going to want to write this. Uh, we actually have something for setting the directory buffer. Uh, somewhere in the directory code. Hmm. Or not. Okay, so we seek. Uh, I remember how this works. Compute the sector number of the block in X A. Okay, we should have got that block from somewhere. And yes, then we update current sector and right sector here will actually set that. So So we're actually going to put this here because set FCB block should return, yeah, preserves XA. So uh, this will seek to our new block. We then enter the wipe code. So we clear the directory buffer to all zeros. We set up the DMA. So now here, all we need to do is to call right sector. We then want to increment the sector count. If rollover, if rollover, Like so, uh, we now want to find out whether we've actually reached the end, which we are going to do by uh, ending the current sector with block mass. Block mask is the, uh, the the mask needed to turn uh, sectors into records. So this, when this becomes zero, we know that we're on the next block. And, okay, so we fall out the bottom of this. But we need uh, we need to get our actual block number in XA, which we can do by just doing get FCB block because we now know that the block has been allocated. 
and then we'll call get sequential sector number again to return the sector pointer to where it was before. None of this is quick, but we're touching the disk, so it's, it's not the most efficient code in the world, but it doesn't matter. Uh. Okay. And it builds. So we now need a test program. So we're going to put this back uh, A to I CPM FCB two dot F zero. Okay, we open a file if a if the open failed we create it is that make file make file okay cpm fcp r equals r so this will seek to a particular location we then write garbage to the file with CPM write random filled CPM FCB and close the file. And this needs to be a just a okay. So let's give this a try and see what happens. So create a dat file and we are going to write to record 100. We have a file which is the right size. So let's take a look at our file system and we see this is test.sub uh, 15000, oh yeah, uh, 15400 is the start of the next block, 1k blocks, which are 400. So we have empty space, then our record worth of data then empty space down to the end of the block. I think that worked. Uh, so we are going to also write to record 101. Still one block, that should have been the same block. What we've done here, there we go. We now have two 128 blocks worth of gibberish. So writing to a subsequent block has not overwritten the first block. So let's get rid of that. And this time we're going to write to record one. And we should be able to dump that and okay that has set the record count to two indicating there are two records in the block it's written zeros to the first one yes this is what we would expect if we had done this without using the filled option we would have got this data in the second record, but the first record would be full of junk. Although, because this is all backed up by a MOS file, when you extend a MOS file, it will write 
uh, no, it won't allocate data, but the virtual disk we're using is full of zeros. So that's not actually going to help. Anyway, I believe this is working. Good. That was surprisingly straightforward. Okay, so there's one big thing that I haven't done yet, which is I want um, I want some better error handling. So we're going to allocate a byte for to record the stack when we start a system call. So transfer x to s store in entry stack. Because this then allows us to uh, actually while I'm at it I'm just going to put this in this will just fail with safely with an error and not do anything okay uh, we're going to put in a error handler um, Prints the message in AXA and uh, don't need to do that. So on a hard error, uh, we print a message, we wait for the keyboard input, the user has to press a key, and then we do a warm boot according to the docs. So we don't actually need to exit the system call. We're killing the program. So this has actually gotten easier. We're going to put this up here so we can fall through. Do we have a print routine? I don't think we do. Ah, we've got uh, we've got write string here. Yes, we can call write string. Because this will then uh, reset the stack, uh, reload the CCP, etc., etc. So, we want an example of doing this. Well, there's the write-only disk stuff. Yeah. Sorry, I'm yawning. Um, uh, but the other thing we want to do is to check for overwriting a read only file so that will be well our So write sequential is going to need to do this.
So what this will do is it will check the uh, the read-only flag in the FCB, which has been opened from the directory. Okay, for random access, again, we do that there. Ran, uh, write random field gets that by default. So... Okay, so we want to also put checks in in rename but this time because the file hasn't been opened we haven't read the FCB we want to check the writable flag in the dear end. Uh, and the same thing happens for delete file. And uh, now it would be tempting to put the same thing here and set file address, but that would make it impossible to actually, you know, unset the, uh, the read only flag. So is that all we need? So we can get our list of system calls. Uh, open and close on unrelated because in CPM we don't tell the system whether we want to write to the file until we actually try to write it. We've done delete. Create is unaffected because create doesn't work if the file already exists. Yeah, okay, I think that's it. So... This would be under directory management, which is around here somewhere. So Okay, so over here we can see that the read-only bit is in the top bit of T1. So, this will be FCB T1, uh, LDA param comma Y, that will set the, uh, the top bit. So in fact, all we do here is branch to not writable error, otherwise return. And over here in check dear and writable, it's exactly the same thing except we use current dear end. So do here is we load our message into XA and we jump to hard error. So let's run it. So uh, here is our dat file. Let's make this read only like so and then we'll try and delete it and the file is hmm <laughs> why did that happen
Has that actually updated the, the, the thing on disk? Yes, it has. It's at the top. Ah, ah, I know what's going on here. Uh, yes, uh, this happened when we set the file to be read-only. It has actually set the top bit there. So if we do that read-write, it goes away. That's actually a bug in our CCP because our directory lister here uh, needs to be masking off the top bit. So here we go. Like so. And we do the same thing here. And now this is just too big. Uh, so we're going to have to do do that. One five is too big. Right, this is trying to jump up to the beginning of the loop. I this is common code. So put the space in. Okay, so that now fits. So we uh, let's set test.com to be read only. I can't even remember what test.com does now. It's one of the test programs. And now we see that it is set correctly. We should be, we should not be allowed to rename it. Correct. We should not be allowed to erase it, correct, but we can set it to be read-write, and then we can delete it. Good. Okay, and that has also shrunk our CCP a little, which is nice. Um... however big it's got to. Okay, so back to the BDOS. I think the last major thing we need to implement is the disk writable stuff. 
and this is straightforward. This just checks to see whether the current disk is in the read-only vector. Now we've got some code for doing this. So we just copy this code. So this is the uh, this is the write protect vector. Why is the active drive? We shift so the flag is at the bottom of temp plus zero. So we then take the flag into the carry. If the carry is set, that means the flag is right protected. So, so we load the value and jump to hard error. Okay, uh, do we have a way to actually test this? I think stat will do it. So stat val will give us, here we go, stat val gives us the help. So we should be able to do uh, a becomes read only, like so. Uh, stat should now say that a is read only. So a should still work, but if we try and de delete something, then that shouldn't have worked because we do need to uh, we do need um, close file I think we need that there as well, just to make sure that changes don't get flushed to a file once the file has been made read-only. Yeah, we're going to have to put checks in all our system calls. So everything beginning with write that's not write string. Check that the FCB is writable, check that the disk is writable. Check the FCB is writable, check that the disk, don't need anything there. Uh, rename file, check that the disk is writable. Entry arrays file, check that the disk is writable, okay. So let's make a read only and let's try and delete stat.com disk is read only and when we drop back to the ccp good okay and how big is our BDOS these days? Ha! <laughs> it is just under 3.5k. That makes it almost exactly the same size as the 8080 version of the BDOS. 
there is probably some cleanup and shrinkage I can do here. Uh, for example, here. So this is where the entry point is for a system call is called. We then we push all the registers so we can do some stuff here, but we don't need to push X because we're not doing anything with X here. We do need to push Y, so that's not a lot of code. Uh, there's little bits that can be shared that will probably do horrible things to maintainability. But on the whole, I think this works. It's simple enough that there shouldn't be any really subtle bugs. It'll either work or not work. The biggest issue is running into uh, edge cases to do with the the dear end and module and extent stuff. But I am going to call this done. So what we have is we've got a port actually here for the BBC Micro. Uh, we've got the, the BIOS here, which is a tiny file under half K. We've got the BDOS. We've got the CPM file system, which should be bigger than that. It will grow as you write files. We have no CPM software, so there's nothing you can actually do with it yet. I have found that Microsoft have open sourced their famous 6502 basic, so that should be a really easy port. It'd be nice to have a, a Microsoft basic that will run on this thing. Uh, love doing that. There's the hole where that file was and it will always allocate the first block so it will start filling stuff up there. That will lead to terrible fragmentation but honestly we don't really care. And uh, also there's another thing to show you which is this. This is a Commodore 64 emulator because I have done a Commodore 64 BIOS. So here, here is our disk with very similar files. We can load the CPM program and we run this. It's a tiny basic loader. This is all machine code. And where did that garbage come from? Interesting. And hmm, well, this worked when I tested it earlier. Yeah, I know what's going on here, and it's really stupid. You know how we made hard error fall through to exit? Well, guess what was already falling through? So, yeah. Uh, no, I don't want to. Hmm. Okay, so now that's fixed, this should work. So we're just going to attach the disk image like so and auto start it so just types in the relevant things and here we have a working prompt and there are all our files and everything works well nearly everything works uh, that's not quite right there are a few wrinkles that need looking at that's very not right actually that's not parsing the
Interesting. Well, a lot of this stuff works. <laughs> well, this used to work, honestly. Uh, I spent a little time doing this before today's session and everything was fine then. So it's something I've done with the recent code. Well, that should be a jump for a start, but that won't make a difference. Uh, why does that think the file had changed? Okay. I'm a bit suspicious there. Don't I think does the BBC version still work? The BBC version is just fine. The Commodore 64 version is using the same BDOS binary, the same CCP binary, in fact the entire CPMS file image is the same one that the BBC is using. It's actually rather bigger than will fit on a disk, but it will get expanded as needed, so uh, that should be fine. Why is that not working? Okay, FCB parsing looks like it should be all right. On the Commodore 64, this version is using the kernel, far, uh, the C64 kernel to access the disk. Uh, the entire CPMFS image is inside a big rel file, which is excruciatingly slow. What you're looking at here is actually a virtual disk. The emulator here has patched all the entry points of the kernel. If I turn this, put that on, and then do a reset, I don't know if you can hear that noise. It's supposed to be, there we go, this is, this is the correct speed, and it takes a while. It's currently loading the BDOS, right now it's loading the CCP, as I can tell from here, and there we are. That's very interesting. Why is that not working? Well, we know that our program will load at 1900. So, if you fire up the debugger, in fact, dump.com just ran, so we should be populated here. So, this is the debugger showing the contents of memory. Oh, that's very interesting. Where is our P block? Uh, that has not populated the P block. That's why dump can't tell what it's supposed to be doing. Okay, so let's put a breakpoint at. 1907 go dump dump.com okay he, so here we are at the beginning of dump here so the first thing we're going to do is look at the the fcb in the p block and we can see that 
the P block should be at one A O O. Let's see. Uh, no, actually, at one A. Well, this is going to be the first byte of the file name, and so it should be at one A four seven. This is the relocation information for dump. So why has that not loaded? It's the CCP's job to load the P block. So this should be parsing the the C, the the FCB on the command line into the P block, but it doesn't even seem to be trying to copy the command line. That should be happening here. So how can it not be doing that? So let's figure this out. So to reattach, auto start, go. And actually let's turn this back on try and speed things up a bit. Hey, I don't know if you can hear that, but we get disk noises now. We weren't doing that before. Um, I think I want to turn this off. Yep, there we go. Okay, so now if we run our dump, it will hang, break into the debugger. Uh, why are we CB5E? Because we're inside the CCP, that's where we are. Okay, break CB5E, go. Uh, reboot dump dump dot com okay we break at the debugger I forgot to save my file so it didn't re it didn't uh, recompile it dump dump dot com okay that's better so we are getting the uh, the FCB. Let's just actually skim forwards. Here's where you open the command. We know that works. We get the start address. Blah blah blah. Uh, so there's the call to select disk. There's the DY here. Uh, here we are trying to load the file. That's a right string. BDOS con out, new line. 
get TPA should be here. Expect that to work because it is running the command. Uh, let's just read sequential. No, it's not. That's set DMA. That's read sequential. So. Here, CBDB is where we actually do the relocation. Okay, we're here. And we see that the TPA is from 1.9 to D0, which is what we expect. So... Call set TMA. We call get ZP, which 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 from one nine to nine zero. That number doesn't look right. This is the C sixty four BIOS. And get ZP. See, I wondered whether we were returning the wrong values here. Uh, I'm suspicious. I don't think that should be 1.9 because the BIOS here isn't using anything like that much. Uh, it's using four bytes of uh, zero page, but then there's the BDOS, which is using a chunk two. So, f uh, so in the C64, we start at two, because there are a couple of hardware registers mapped at zero. So that's two, four, six, eight, a C E one zero one two one six one seven. Actually, that does seem reasonable, but it is suspicious. Okay. So we are relocating, uh, starting at zero page one nine and memory page one nine. So we've done the relocation. So if we go and look at one nine zero here, we can see the relocated version of dump. So our T block should be around here somewhere. Our P block rather. So here is where we actually go and calculate it. So we are now patching the jump instruction calculate the address of the programs p block so we're here And we see that the value in XA, which is the address of the P block, is complete garbage. Why is that complete garbage? Actually, I do think I know why. 
Let me go look something up. So I thought that what was wrong was that I was uh, using uh, the wrong part of zero page. Um, because the Commodore 64 zero page is less well organized than on the BBC Micro and the kernel uses bits and pieces all over the place. But the first... Uh, I, I don't think that's the case. What I have observed is that the code that gets loaded here doesn't match what I see in the emulator. So, uh, this is uh, here. So this is here. C806 is where we put the BDOS instruction of the CCP. So then we store through temp. We then load a zero into A. And that's not a zero, that's a 13. So what that's going to do is it'll try to push the pull the address of the P block out of the program header, but get the wrong one. And 13 is kind of what you get from the disk system when you do things like run out of sectors. Or uh, you, you, you seek to put a particular record in a rel file and then you read the appropriate number of bytes. And if you read too many, you'll start getting 13s. And I notice that the address of this ends in FE our records are 128 bytes long because they match sectors but the uh, the see, Commodore DOS sectors are actually 254 bytes long due to the unique way in which the Commodore file system alleged file system operates and I gather that there are bugs. So I am wondering whether I've hit one of these bugs here and it's not correctly loading data off disk. So in our C64 BIOS, here is our read code. We seek to the appropriate place. We seek twice, because that is apparently how you work around one of the bugs. And then we just read 128 bytes and write it into memory. So yes. I am going to investigate this offline and come back. I was hoping this would be a nice triumphant end thing, but we'll see. Well, that was a complete disaster. It is now actually the next day because I have found out what the bug is and done a ton of work to work around it. And I can basically sum it up by saying that the Commodore 64's RHEL file support is fundamentally broken and does not work. So what was happening here, the reason that this bug was occurring, is because this zero parameter to the LDA was the last byte of a CPM sector. That's 128 byte sector. This was being stored in the RHEL file as a 128 byte record, which meant that the zero was the last byte of the record. And according to this document, which I found all about rel file bugs, if a record ends with zeros, then DOS 
on this Commodore 64 will not return them. I am not entirely sure this is accurate. This says that it will actually jump to the first byte of the next record, i.e. skip trailing zeros in a record, but I was observing that I was getting ODs, 13s, instead. So I am not entirely sure, but this also describes another couple of horrifying bugs which would cause random data corruption uh, with random access patterns in a rel file. So that combined with whatever was going wrong here, I have just given up and I'm not using rel files anymore. So what I did was I am now using that's the wrong file raw sector access and this works fine. So let me fire up the emulator. I just want to make a couple of changes here for reasons which will become apparent. Turn this off. So we then attach the disk image, which is this. So you can see that we now have a BDOS file. Uh, actually, no, we had a BDOS file before. Uh, we, I have gone through an iteration off camera where we didn't have a BDOS file. So we auto start and it boots. And everything is fine. If I can... So we can run the stats command and there you go. It has statted the disk. Uh, we can see that we now have two hidden system files. Uh, I can even run the test submit script and it did it. Um, I've actually observed a bug there that needs fixing, but I won't do that now. Uh, that's interesting. That did actually work. Interesting. Uh, in the, if I try to do a DIR of another user from inside a submit script, it would actually return uh, the directory for user zero. I bet this is because reading the record from the submit script is interfering with the current record, the current user. But that's a minor thing. As I've been saying constantly, CPM's user support is kind of broken. Uh, but everything works. Uh, I can dump things. Yeah. Which is nice. And in fact, the way this works is this uses horrifying techniques to make a disk image that is both a valid uh, Commodore 64 disk image with the, uh, the byte allocation map and a Commodore CBM DOS directory and is also a valid CPM file system at the same time. So I can do uh, one C64 to D64. So there is the contents of the CPM side of things. And if I can remember how to do this, uh, C64, D64 ls dir uh, see, just trying to remember what command it is there we go and there is the directory of the same disk image in Commodore 64 mode uh, the way this works is uh, the reserved sectors for both file systems are in different places so I can make a, uh, I can make a file in the CPM file system, that's the cbm.sys, that covers the, uh, the parts of the, of the Commodore uh, file system that are in use, and vice versa. Uh, here it's clearing out the block allocation map to ensure that uh, CBM DOS doesn't overwrite the 
uh, sectors used by the CPM file system and given that one of them is called CBM and the other is called CPM that's not confusing at all anyway there is a problem of course so let me go over here and turn yep that's gone back on which is if I attach the disk image and boot it And the problem, as you can see, is that it's very, very slow. Part of this is the fact that uh, this, the Commodore 64 has a 1 megahertz processor, which isn't very quick. But mostly it's due to the fact that the Commodore 64 disk system is possibly the slowest disk in the world. It transfers data at 300 bytes per second, which means that a single uh, 256K Commodore sector takes almost a second to transfer, so everything takes an age. Uh, I will point out that 300 bytes per second is twice as fast that is only twice as fast as the BBC Micro's cassette system, which is not so brilliant. But it does all work very, very slowly. So because the Commodore sectors are 256 bytes, I'm actually storing two CPM records in each one. You can see the pause as it loads the next sector of disk. Um, there are a few wrinkles. I think, the yeah, the control key doesn't work properly, so I can't control C out of this, but that's a minor front end issue. So, yes, that's nice but it does work. There are ways around this. The simplest thing to do is to implement a proper fast loader. In this, the way this works is that instead of just using the default very slow serial protocol to transfer data from the disk system to the Commodore 64, you instead use a custom much faster protocol and you can get up to like 10k per second or which is fine, but uh, that's really annoying to do. And frankly, I am fed up of this by now. So I'm going to leave this for the time being. It does work. Um, in the C64 BIOS, uh, we actually have a 256 byte disk buffer which uh, is used to store the sector last loaded so that uh, reading a single 256 byte sector can then be used for, for both 128 byte record reads uh, and changes that's made are lazily flushed back to disk and so on it's actually pretty standard CPM has uh, standard algorithms for doing this but anyway, that all works. Oh yes, and the let me fire up the BBC Master version just to demonstrate that this still works. Like so. This isn't particularly quick either. Uh, the BBC Micro has this amazingly fast disk system that's capable of transferring a complete track of data in one revolution, which we are not using because CPM reads a single sector at a time, so it wastes all that, which is why it's just kind of slow. Like running stat takes several seconds to run which is better than on the C64 where it will take about 45 seconds to run which is kind of embarrassing 
So, what is next with this? Well, I'm going to stop doing videos, so this is the last one, thankfully. The biggest problems are really, to make this useful, is that there is no software. So what this really needs is an assembler and a simple editor, like, you know, Edlin type thing. Uh, there are some around. The traditional CPM80 editor was, I think it was written in PLM, and there are no modern PLM compilers. So that might be interesting to take a look at. Uh, and then I can compile the original PLM source code to 6502 machine code using LLVM, which would be cool. Uh, but there's also other things like the fact that uh, you can't really do anything with the screen. Both the C64 and the BBC Micro use different escape sequences to talk to the outside world. And uh, it would be nice to fix this. One option is to implement something like a VT52 terminal emulator in the BIOS. But honestly, uh, I think what I'd rather do is exploit a feature of the way we've done things with relocatable binaries and implement a, a simple device driver model so that you can load at runtime a device driver for doing things like providing screen support. Uh, this would then use a couple of pages of uh, memory um, so you see this system has uh, 60, 65 hex pages of RAM left. If I fire up x64, so if you wanted to do screen stuff, it would be perfectly feasible to load the driver to give you uh, a simple cursors like interface which so you get library calls for doing things like moving around on the screen and drawing text rather than having to use escape sequences there we go and on the C64 which has a lot more memory we now have B5 hex pages free which is nice uh, by the way if I were to implement a fast loader I, we wouldn't need the kernel anymore so we'd be able to reuse everything above D000 to the end of the address space as RAM. So we'd have huge amounts of memory free, which would be very nice, particularly for running stuff like compilers. Uh, so yeah, device drivers, that would also allow loading things like serial drivers if you need them. That could make, uh, where's my entry point? that would make things like aux input and output work again because these are not implemented in the core BDOS in this model so that you only have to load them if you need them, stuff like that uh, as I said earlier there's Microsoft's basic that would be very easy to port to this system and it's worth re-emphasizing the same BDOS binary is being used on both the BBC Micro and C64 and will work on all other 6502 systems. The same CCP binary, likewise. All those applications, likewise. Uh, it's a genuinely portable system. Uh, all you have to do is write the BIOS and then you will have a basic system uh, that will run on, on anything. It will adapt to however much memory you have available. Uh, it'll still load the same programs on any system. So that's actually better than uh, real CPM80, which relied on having the same memory layout on all systems. So this does actually form the core of a proper self-hosting portable operating system that will run on all 6502 machines which is pretty cool anyway I am now done I'm declaring this finished or at least code complete I'll fiddle with it and fix some of the bugs there are some 
and write it up and document it and so on. All the source is available on GitHub. Look in the description for links. I would love to make this work on other platforms like uh, the Auric has uh, 48 to 64k of RAM and a fast disk system. This would run beautifully on one of those. Uh, the Apple II likewise. Uh, the Apple II's disk system is weird so it might be tricky to adapt. Uh, on the Apple II the floppy disk system is mostly handled in software so you'd have to keep all that software around to read and write disk sectors so that's irritating but there's a whole bunch of 6502 systems this, this could be ported to anyway that's all finally over 14 videos more or less two weeks it's not it's a little bit more than two weeks of real time if you are still watching I hope you've enjoyed watching this and uh, I will see you in the next project.